Hello, and welcome back to The Offspring Magazine, the podcast. It's Bea, and I will be hosting today's podcast. Today will be part two of our conversation with Dr. Ben Ryan, who is a postdoc in Dr. Robert Malenka's lab at Stanford University, and is also a science communicator. Today's conversation will focus on Ben's research. Ben studied the neuroscience of autism during his PhD. And so today we will talk about autism in general, such as what is autism, what are common symptoms, what are the causes, and we also specifically talk about some of Ben's findings in the field of autism research. Currently, Ben is studying social behaviors and the neuroscience of empathy and pain. And so stay tuned to be blown away by some cool neuroscience papers that Ben will describe on the neuroscience of pain and empathy. Please enjoy part two with Ben Ryan. Now time to switch. And I want to talk to you about your PhD research. Um, mm-hmm. You said you uh, did it in autism, right? Yep. On autism. So maybe let's first give like a clinical definition of what autism is, just so that everyone is kind of on the same page. Yeah, autism is a, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. And um, the, there, there are two diagnostic criteria. One is uh, persistent deficits in social interaction or communication. And the second, which is pretty interesting in itself, is repetitive behaviors or restricted interests. And you need to have both to be diagnosed, at least in the United States, which is really interesting. I I just, I'm fascinated by why those two things are so often concurrent, especially because what we understand, it appears that they have different neurobiological underpinnings, at least in many cases. Um, so it's a, anyways, already getting off topic. <laughs> There's your. It's fine. It's yeah. completely fine. Yeah. So, th- so those are the, those are the diagnostic criteria. So social deficits and repetitive behaviors. Okay. And how, how do we diagnose autism? Is there a, um, a written test or medical procedure? Yeah. So I, everything I know is based on what happens in the U S it's all based off of the DSM. And I assume this is international, um, so, but if I'm wrong in a different country, then uh, I apologize. I'm also a basic researcher. I, 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 I'm very familiar with what autism looks like in a mouse. Um, although, of course, it's not actually autism, but we study social behavior in mice. My, I've never actually worked with with autism patients, people with autism. So, um, this is all literally all my knowledge is based off of what I've read from papers, which is kind of sad. But uh, autism is diagnosed through something called the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. So it's an observational test. Um, And I actually have seen this done. I've gone to a clinic and participated in this. It's really, really fascinating. So let's say, you know, mother brings in, uh, I'll just talk about what I saw. Mother brings in her 10 or 12 year old daughter, a little bit worried, you know, seems to be having some, some trouble with social interactions, maybe fitting in at school, things like that. Um, And I should add, this is, this is a little bit atypical. Usually the diagnosis would happen younger, like around somewhere between like one and three or four years old, you know, the mother, parents might start to notice that there's trouble with eye contact, things like that. So, so in this case, we have a, you know, young girl, she's 10 or 12, something like that. And what will happen is the, um, the pediatric psychiatrist will really just engage with the, the person and have a conversation you know, just ask a bunch of questions about herself and start doing different things. Like, um, they both get a sheet of paper and the psychiatrist will draw something on the sheet of paper. And then the person, I don't know if I should call it the subject, the patient, I'm, again, this is my non expertise. Um, yeah. what, what do they, uh, say in papers? <laughs> This uh, the patient, I suppose. Is, yeah, yeah. I suppose in this case, it's a patient. I wouldn't it's know what's clinical. correct either. Yeah, I'll say patient because it's a clinical setting that yeah. they're being seen by a doctor. So the patient um, has to draw the same thing. So it's like this sort of interesting social dynamic test where they're observing someone doing something and then having to recapitulate that entire behavior themselves, or like 
stacking a bunch of blocks in a certain way and then they have to stack the blocks in the same way so it's like can they observe and and uh do the same thing and identify those social cues another thing which is maybe more clear and interpretable of why this might be done is like showing different images of facial expressions fear anger sadness excitement and asking them to identify what emotion is being expressed and so there's a bunch of tests like this and um and then at the end of it, the psychiatrist, at least in my experience, what they did is they sat down with this questionnaire, th this sort of form and filled out like a bunch of ratings on how the, the patient did. And if they meet a numerical threshold, then it is cause for an uh, autism diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like autism is a huge spectrum. Like you could probably be mildly autistic and severely autistic, but it's good that there is actually a test. Um to diagnose you. I feel like sometimes autism, I, I think there's a danger that it gets like the word gets thrown around a lot, but um, I'm happy that there's like an actual test. Yeah. Uh, so I should add to, sorry. Oh, yeah. um, it is autism spectrum disorder. So it's ASD. Uh, and in the past there's been autism and Asperger's Asperger's is no longer uh, in the DSM. So now it's just autism spectrum disorder. And because of what you've said, you know, it's such a, the, the, clinical presentation is so variable and what these when i shadowed these psychiatrists what they said to me was one when you've met one person with autism you've met one person with autism you know it's not that everyone on the spectrum appears this you know behaves the same it's that everyone is different and um and actually we can get into this later but the underpinning neurobiology also kind of reflects that there are so many different causes and so many different systems involved yeah, so I definitely want to talk about the causes of autism. And here, I don't know how much is known. I also don't know how advanced autism research is and kind of... So I, actually, my first question would be, when was autism first classified as a like disorder? That's a heck of a question. I'm not actually sure if I know the answer. I don't, I don't know the year, but I would... Um... You know what? Can I just like Google this right yeah, now? Yeah, I need yeah, 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 sure. I guess I could have Googled this beforehand as well. <laughs> well, I need, I need to know. I'm just interested also to know like uh, when kind of autism research started. If that's, if it's a more like recent thing. Yeah. It started like ages back. Well, so according to Google, autism, autism was first used as a diagnostic term in 1943, but Okay. More recently, the diagnostic criteria changed, as I mentioned, about autism yeah. spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I believe, has changed the frequency of diagnosis a lot. Yeah. Well, I would say that's pretty recent, 1943, and then another change later on. Were you... So how how, how advanced is autism research or research in autism? It's... um. I would say it's pretty advanced. I mean, it's... I would say it's not as, like, cutting edge. It's not as sophisticated as other fields like maybe like addiction where um in my experience and i'm talking about like basic research in in animal models i would say um you know there's been tons of research done in humans but when it comes to like identifying the underlying like circuit changes in the brain and things like that and using like these advanced lab tools things like optogenetics and the sort um there don't seem to be as many studies going on with that type of technology. So, and I think part of the reason is there are so many causes like you've, like you mentioned, um, that, do you mind if I just start talking about the causes so, of autism? So you can go on a monologue. <laughs> All right. I'm happy to listen. So there are, yeah. So from what we understand, genetic risk factors play a huge factor, um, or play a huge role. So estimates, Somewhere, I mean, at a maximum, the highest estimate I've seen is somewhere around 60% of all autism cases are driven by a genetic mutation or some genetic change. Um, in reality, it might be somewhere between like 30 and 60%, hard to say. Then there are... I actually thought it was going to be a lot higher. I thought it was going to be like 80, 90%. That's what you might think, right? And it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's, um, it's just so interesting. I guess I have so much to say on this topic. Good, good, good. <laughs> so the, I'll, no, I'll try not to interrupt. No, no, no. It's okay because you're getting me thinking about other things too. I mean, let me just back all the way up and just say this. My view on autism um, as a scientist who studies the neurobiology, 
is that there are systems in the brain that control everything. I, I'm of the belief that everything about us is controlled by the brain. Not everything, of course, but most things like, you know, you're, it seems pretty obvious, like your mood is change, driven by brain, brain changes, you know, your social interaction, your personality is driven by brain changes, your worldview, all these things could be manipulated by changing the function of the brain. And so autism is a situation where by some mechanism, unknown in most cases, um, or unknown in many cases, the function of the brain has changed and some facet of social interaction has changed. And when I say some facet, I mean, there are many components of social interaction. There's, you know, just think about how complex an interaction is. You're sensing the other person's tone. You're reading their facial expressions. You're looking at their body language. That's just on the other person. You're also thinking about your own, what are you saying? What are the words coming out of your mouth? What is the tone? What are your facial expressions and your body language? And you're kind of trying to synchronize the two. And that alone is such a complex thing. But then also think about the, all the information that's also being transferred between two people. And, and that's just a one-on-one -on -one interaction in a group setting. You know, maybe you're in a, a, a work meeting where you're sitting around a table and your boss is there. So many different things go into social interactions. I mean, it's a really complex workout for the brain. Maybe the person is sick and, you know, and you're trying to stay away from them, but trying to be empathetic and, you know, maybe they're hurt and you feel empathy for them. There's all these different facets of social interaction and there's many different brain systems that regulate all these things. So if there are any changes to any of these brain systems, it can result in some form of atypical social interaction that may or may not fall into the classification of autism spectrum disorder based on the diagnostic criteria that human beings have just chosen, right? <laughs> so there are so many things that can change the function of these brain systems that may or may not result in an autism diagnosis. And so going back now, there are genetic risk factors, tons of them. There are at least like a hundred well-known, like solid genetic risk factors that if this gene has a mutation randomly or you're, you inherit it, your likelihood of getting, of, of being diagnosed with, with autism is much higher than someone without that gene mutation. But that's just the main like primary risk factors there have been others identified too. There maybe are a thousand out there that like, they're not as prevalent. They're, they're not as um, penetrant, you would say. But if you, you know, they are associated with autism in human populations. So let's say 50% or so of autism um, diagnoses are driven by a genetic risk factor. What about the rest? Well, there's also environmental factors. Um, so things like Exposure to certain compounds in utero, like valproic acid, has, has been shown to increase uh, autism prevalence. Um, exposure to certain like toxins or pollutants, th things like that, all early in development or in utero um, can be risk factors. And then the other classification, so there's like genetic risk factors, environmental risk factors, and then the third is just idiopathic. We just don't know. Um, and so to get to your question of how advanced is the, the research field, I mean, it could be a lot, we could know a lot more, you know, it seems like we, we don't really know a lot, but at the same time, there are tons of labs out there researching just the genetic component of that. And just think about how much of a task that is in a, in a disorder like, um, like Huntington's, I'll come back to that. It's a single, it's a monogenic disorder, right? You have a gene mutation in, a, in the Huntington gene. It's a single gene. And we're still figuring out how it, like what's going on. So this is a, an entire field of research based on understanding one single genetic mutation. And I just said that autism has at least a hundred risk factors. So trying to figure out how all of these genetic risk factors change brain function to result in autism is the work of at least a hundred research labs. Um, and that's just the genetic component. So it's really a really huge problem, um, like a really huge problem to solve. I mean, like a research problem to address. So it's it's a it's a big undertaking. The field is advancing, you know, slowly, like all science fields do. Um, but I do think we could know a whole lot more. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the causes, I understand the genetic. I understand the environmental. Um, the way you explained it seemed like it can come through substances. C can you also develop autism based on like interaction with other people? So like, I don't know if this experiment has ever been done in like a mouse, but like if you took a mouse and you isolated them for 
I don't know, a year or what, I don't know, lifetime of a mouse, Mm -hmm. but for some time with another mouse that was autistic, could the other mouse then develop autism as well? Or is that not possible? Um, well, okay. First clarification, just want to say, we never say that like a mouse has autism, right? Because autism is a human oh, condition. Right. Yeah. Um, oh gosh. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> but, but your question still stands, right? Did, would they, we have mouse models of autism and these mouse models, they carry the same genetic mutations that we see in humans and they present with the same type of behaviors. They're less social. Um, so the question stands, right? It, would they show the same behaviors? Um, isolation is something I'm really interested in. It's something I'm, I, I have been studying. And um, there are there are papers out there that show that if you isolate mice early in development, they present with social deficits later in life. Um, so it's possible, I suppose, that isolation itself could drive what would end up in an autism diagnosis. Um, I have theories about like what's going on in the biology, but like interacting with another mouse with an autism linked gene mutation. Um, I'm pretty sure those studies have been done and it doesn't affect the behavior of the, what we would call wild type mouse. Um, and, and I think the same would be true in humans. So it's also hard. Um, you, you wouldn't really be able to develop autism later in life. I guess it's something that comes early in life. Yeah, I think so. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder, right? So, I mean, again, I tend to think about this as like, like I described neurobiological changes that are being classified based on these human classifications where you, you, to be diagnosed with autism, you need to suspect you might have autism, go to a clinic and have a group of psychiatrists say you fit into our criteria. We've kind of just decided on, um, but what we're really talking about is like a broad range of neurobiological changes. So it appears that, yeah, that the changes happen early in life, very early in life, um, throughout development. So to be diagnosed with autism later in life can happen, but it's pro- it's likely that you would have had autism the entire time. Yeah, yeah, okay. What about um, treatments or ways in which we can improve the like common symptoms of autism? What What is on... What is there? I don't want to say on the market because oftentimes when you say treatments, people straight away go like drugs. And I'm assuming drugs is not the only way that you can uh, improve autism. Yeah. Um, just going to tie this into our discussion on social media. I have found that speaking about my research on autism has been extremely controversial, has gotten me into some trouble um, because there are a lot of people who, it, it's a very sensitive topic. You know, there are, I've learned that people who are on the spectrum do not like to be, do not like the suggestion that autism should be treated. Um, yeah, I, I kind of, I figured um, that, that, but I just don't know what the right way is to, to talk about it either. And like what the right terms are to use. It's really hard for me. Yeah, it's a challenge. And I mean, I've, I've tried my best to learn, you know, through interactions on social media and stuff. Um, and my genuine belief and has always been this is that I, I do not view autism as a condition that must be treated. Absolutely not. Or a condition that should be treated. Um, certainly it's not life endangering or anything like that. I view it as something where to answer your question, there are no treatments for the social symptoms of autism, none, zero, at least pharmacological treatments. You know, there are like behavioral interventions, but there are no treatments if you want to, if you, if you are a person who has been diagnosed with autism and you really struggle with social interaction and you wish it wasn't that way, there are no options for you. And I personally, as a person who's really social, I think that would be challenging for me and I would feel disappointed and I would feel frustrated. And so my perspective is, you know, I'm not in autism research to identify a treatment, but if through my research, a treatment is discovered, that would be phenomenal because I think that at least people should have the option. I don't, you know, it's, it's not at all a condition where people should be, you know, diagnosed and immediately prescribed, you know, but if, if they want the option, it's there. Yeah. I think, I think we need to give people the option of like, if you want to improve certain symptoms through some kind of, I don't know, medication or whatever, then you should, should have the option. 
Yeah, and maybe right. even worse, the only pharmacological treatments that are available are to treat like agitation and like mm. um, aggressiveness, like aggressive behavior, things like that, uh, which I think is maybe worse. I don't know. Um, I, I'm I'm really interested in understanding what brain systems regulate sociability and how we can potentially. If, but to understand these brain systems, a part of these studies is to test whether they are necessary and sufficient for those symptoms or for those behaviors. And so let's say we have a brain area that we're interested in and we think it's involved in sociability. To test if it's necessary for a, so, for a positive social interaction, what we might do in mice is turn off that brain area during an interaction and see does it reduce the amount of time that they spend interacting. On the other hand, what we might do is turn on that brain area, activate it and see if activating that area is sufficient to increase their interaction. And so what we might end up doing in, in an autism mouse model is the same thing. We have a mouse that's now interacting less at baseline because it has an autism linked gene mutation. The question would be, if we activate this brain area, does it make them more social? And the, we're not asking that question because we want to treat autism. We're asking that question because it's a necessary component of our research to identify whether this system actually is involved in what we're studying. And so that was part of what I did in my PhD research. I can get into it if you'd like, but I, I also up... saw you, you had, you had a, you posted a video super recently, I think. I don't know if it was super recent or not, but it was like on your paper and you got, you were doing like studying certain, you can talk yep. about it. I'm yeah. going to get something wrong. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'll explain it all in a, in a moment. I just, um, yeah, good. well, I was just going to say, so we found that, you know, it, changing this activity in this one brain area in my PhD research increased the amount of time that these mice spent interacting and so with other mice uh, socializing and that's interesting and fantastic because now mechanistically we know that that brain area is important but that also does lend net lend itself naturally to potentially a treatment for autism if we wanted to develop one and and it was at that time when i when i proposed that and discussed that on social media was when i started getting um like backlash and uh and that made, when I was, that's when I was realizing, like, wait a minute, I'm a genuinely doing this research and presenting it in this way out of like an altruistic intention to make people's lives better if they want it. And it's being perceived as me being like kind of um, like a eugenicist, you know, like that I think autism should be eradicated and that people with autism are not okay and that they should be treated, you know. So um, it's been really tough. And this is, again, one of the lessons that I've learned on social media. Uh, but you know, this, this research is still important, I think. I think it's, and like we said, autism is a spectrum as well. So it could be that people with mild autism don't need any treatment, don't want any treatment. But what if you're dealing with the most severe cases? Like, I think in severe cases, like these yeah, people or kids, they can be completely isolated and also have problems then later in life to like really take care of themselves. So if you can just facilitate their lives by improving their social interactions so that they can, I don't know, get a better job or just do better in a job, then yeah, we, we shouldn't shut that down. Yeah, absolutely. And I will also say part of the reason why this has been so interesting for me is while I've gotten a lot of that feedback that I've described where people are saying, you know, this is horrible, you shouldn't be saying these things. You know, I, I am on the spectrum and I'm perfect just the way I am. I don't need to be changed. There are also the opposite where I have people like parents reaching out to me and saying, please, I will do anything. How do I enroll my child in your clinical trial to, to test this thing you've developed? And, you know, I have no clinical trial, just saying. Um, but, you know, there these these families are desperate because they have a child and they're struggling to interact with this child. And and who knows, maybe the child's feeling the same way that they're struggling to interact um, and and maybe they're even ex having trouble expressing that, that they wish they could interact better. And it's, it could be really tough. And, and again, I am in no position to speak on behalf of anyone with autism. Uh, nevertheless, everyone with autism, but um, you know, it's, it's a spectrum, like you said. And so everyone's experience is different. And in some cases that experience might be better if there were some sort of treatment available. And in many cases it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that study. Um, that you published, I think it was your paper, um, more, most recent one, maybe, I don't know. So yeah, the, I'll talk about my main PhD research. So there, I've mentioned that there are many gene mutations. There's many genes that if there's a mutation in that gene, 
and therefore the, the function of that gene is disrupted, that it's m increases the likelihood of being diagnosed with autism. There are also gene like segments where there are clusters of genes. They're called um, like a gene locus. And these entire like gene loci, where it's multiple genes, can be either duplicated or triplicated or deleted. They're called copy number variations. And so on chromosome 16, there's a section of like 27 genes called 16P11.2. The P is position. So it's chromosome 16, position 11.2. And if the entire section is deleted or duplicated, it can result in autism in either condition. So I spent a lot of my PhD figuring out like what the heck's going on there. And there's a ton going on, of course, when you have 27 genes altered in their expression, a lot changes in the brain. So that was a fun way to enter my, my research career by trying to figure out what's, what's going on when 27 genes are duplicated. Um, but bottom line, what we found is something very simplistic and obviously not the whole story, but in the deletion, when the genes are deleted in the prefrontal cortex, a part of the brain that's very involved in higher level fo cognitive function and social cognition, you know, thinking social interactions in general, um, kind of like the brain's like babysitter, you know, like it kind of babysits the other brain areas and, and tells them like when to be quiet and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's a very high level brain area. The, the activity of this brain area was altered. So in the deletion, the brain cells were less active due to a deficit in what we call glutamatergic synaptic transmission. So this is um, excitatory transmission. So there's the cells are sending, and I'm summarizing this in case the viewer, uh, the listener is, is knows nothing about neuroscience. So in the brain, the cells communicate. And we found that the, the positive signals that tell the cells, where, where cells tell each other to activate, those signals were kind of lost in a way. And so the brain, the entire brain area, this prefrontal cortex, which should be regulating social interactions and all this higher level thinking, the whole area was sort of less active in general. And these mice showed social deficits. They were less interested. They also showed um, cognitive deficits. And so on the other hand, when the genes were duplicated, we found that the brain area was too active. The brain cells were actually too active. And you might think, well, why is that a bad thing? You know, when we want, it, isn't that like unlocking like God mode, like our brain's like, you know, or prefrontal cortex is just like firing on all cylinders. It's actually not because there's a, there's a delicate balance of excitability that needs to be maintained. And so you, you want to maintain yourself, right? You know, the cells want to maintain themselves in this, you know, homeostatic level of activation. And if they're not active enough, as you might expect, they're not getting their jobs done. If they're too active, it becomes chaotic. And it's, you know, it's like your computer when you have a hundred tabs open, right? Your computer's trying to do way too many things at once. So we found that in either case, restoring the excitability back to that homeostatic kind of middle level was sufficient to make the mice more social. And so it's really complicated. As I mentioned, there's a change in the expression of 27 genes, but the bottom line is that somehow through some downstream mechanism, that genetic change is altering the activity of this brain area and restoring the activity of that brain area to its baseline level is enough to make the mice more social again. So that's sort of like the, the quick summary of uh, years of research and several pu publications. How sad is that? <laughs> <laughs> it can all boil down to just that. Um, but that's really exciting, right? Um, because then if you understand that, then hopefully that can also uh, help you understand what, like you could probably design drugs to kind of bring this state back to the homeostasis, right? Yeah. And so I mentioned that in the deletion, there was a problem with the excitatory synapses. In the duplication, there was a problem with the inhibitory synapses. So it was the opposite. So you could think about it as green lights and red lights. So if there's, if there's not enough green lights, the brain cells are all sitting at red lights. There's not enough activity. On, in the other hand, on the duplication of this gene, all these genes, there are not enough red lights. So there's too much activity. And so what we found was that if we restore the red lights, um, we restore sort of order to the brain area. The, but the question is, okay, how can we restore those red lights in the first place? If, if the method that we use to restore them in these mice is not at all feasible, we ended up, we injected a virus that overexpresses a protein into this brain area. We could never do it in humans. And I would never encourage anyone to do that um, in their brain. But 
if we can identify the molecular mechanisms that are changing those synapses, then maybe we can target those molecular mechanisms. And my more recent paper, the one that I think the video you're talking about where I, I spoke about this, I found that a molecule uh, called HDAC5, it's an epigenetic enzyme. We found that this molecule was regulating this change. And um, this was a this was actually a protein that we could target through like a a drug, right? Like something you could take, like a SSRI kind of thing. You take a pill and it would change the activity of this molecule and therefore change the activity of these synapses, which would hopefully change the social behavior, improve, enhance the social behavior. Um, so I did publish that paper and, um, you know, I, I've thought about pursuing it, you know, as maybe like a startup kind of thing. But again, it's like, it's kind of a controversial space and um, I'm really not in it for the money. It's just a matter of if I don't do this, will anybody do this? So if anyone's out there and wants to do a clinical trial, let me know. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I think uh, it'd be less controversial in Europe. Really? Um, yeah, I think you would be more successful and get more people to actually want to do that clinical trial here rather than where you are. Yeah, I... I think so. But, uh, but yeah, no, so that sounds interesting. But in that video, you also said like that um, even though we understand, um, we can understand this in mice, like a lot of the mice models don't translate to humans very well. And it's, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, and sorry, if you heard my dog barking in the background, she's, going, she's going bananas this morning. Um, yeah, uh, like I mentioned, there are zero treatments for social symptoms of autism. But that's in humans. In mice, there are tons and tons of treatments for social symptoms of autism. It's, uh, it's kind of disheartening. There have been so many studies that have shown that if we do this or we do that, it can enhance the sociability of these mice in this mouse model of autism. But unfortunately, that just doesn't translate to humans. And, um, and my take on that is that, like I said, social interactions in a human are very complex. There are tons of factors, tons of brain systems. We also have, of course, slightly different brains. Um, but it, I mean, think about a social interaction in a mouse. There's like, there's two primary goals. It's either fight and attack or reproduce. And other than that, I mean, I've watched, I've spent hours, hundreds of hours, maybe thousands, watching videos of mice interacting. And I can tell you what they do. They, they run around and they sniff each other's butts. And then they run the other way and then one of them chases it. And then maybe they attack it the first second. <laughs> it's, it's a completely different interaction. We know it's not how humans interact. And so uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but slightly unsurprising that these treatments don't translate to humans. Yeah. So it's like, this is a recurring thing that just, you've done a lot of mice studies and models and they just don't translate to humans. It's not just like a few. It seems yeah. like a consistent thing, yeah. The treatments, at least, yeah. yeah. Yeah, So why do you keep studying in mice models? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, a lot of the time, I think the studies are done in mice almost all the time. They're done for the reason that I described earlier, where we're just trying to find some mechanistic link, right? We're trying to show the mechanism that changing the activity of this brain area changes the social behavior. It's not that we're you know, testing a treatment necessarily. Um, and that works, right? Like that's easy to do. Uh, not that the experiment works, but that type of study makes sense for scientists to do. Testing drugs without a drug, you know, without a basis for it in human patients in children is not okay, I yeah. think. Um, yeah, that's actually true. You know, so we have to have some sort of physiological basis to move forward with a clinical trial, especially in children. Um, you know, and of course there's tons of safety testing that's done right before any clinical trial would begin. But, um, it, you know, the, if we don't have mouse research to show that it might work, the only thing we would have is a theory. And I think most, most people would probably have at least some animal research to show before they enroll their child in a study. So I'm assuming the big pharmaceutical companies are also not working on any kind of drugs to sell as a potential treatment. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, my 
people who hate on me on the internet would disagree, but I actually have no ties or connections to pharma. Um, people like to criticize me and say that I'm like a pharma shill. That's like the classic criticism you get on social media. Um, but I have no interaction with, with big pharma or any pharma companies. So I'm actually unsure entirely of what, what's going on and what they're doing. Um, I, I would assume that probably once in a while they see some paper, one of the papers I've described where, you know, they show that some treatment helps social behavior in mice and they pick up the drug and say, let's give it a shot. Um, but I'm really not sure like how that's regulated or, or, um, how often that happens. What about non-pharmacological treatments? So I don't know if like some kind of interaction with a person or a mentor or some kind of environmental interaction, like could that also be used to improve some symptoms? Because there was actually um, a Netflix documentary that I watched and it was on like speed cubing. And there they actually talk about one of the um, world champions. He was autistic. And just by interacting with like, kind of his idol, which was the previous world champion, they actually saw that his improve that the symptoms improved. So mm. I just wonder whether we're focusing on that as well as a way to improve the symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that that's probably more well-developed than the pharmacological realm of autism. Uh, I'm not really well, I'm not very familiar with it because again, all my knowledge on this topic comes from papers so I haven't really seen it, but there are lots of behavioral interventions, like things like um, like floor play, right? Like you have a baby, they're struggling with, you're the parent in this situation, they're struggling with eye contact, you're having a hard time connecting with them. Floor play is when you get down on the ground and you play with them up close and you know, you're know you engaging in some fun thing, you're playing with a toy together and you make an effort to like make eye contact. You know, and You're having fun, you're both smiling and laughing and you look at the baby and you laugh together and you smile together and just sort of like encouraging positive social interactions from a very young age. Um, that's just one that I, I've happened to heard about, but there are many other sort of behavioral interventions like that that are used. And I think that's like the front line of you're a parent, your child's just been diagnosed with autism. That's what you do. You, you speak to a, a pediatrician or psychiatrist about what sort of you know, behavioral approaches can we take at home? Um, is there any sort of like group setting we can enroll them in that, that type of thing? And, and I'm pretty sure that that's like the front line. Yeah. But is there also something like in the brain that you could study, like to see whether some kind of I interaction or something changes some of the pathways in the brain that get activated? Yeah. So I mentioned earlier that I have theories about isolation. Um, I believe it seems pretty obvious, actually. So when you're t like Sudoku, or I'm sorry, not Sudoku, Rubik's Cube, right? You, first time you pick up a Rubik's Cube, you have no idea what you're doing. Your brain doesn't know what to do. You're just experimenting. Over time you practice, your brain learns, your brain gets better. And there are some parts of your brain that regulate how to play with a Rubik's Cube, how to solve a Rubik's Cube. And over time, you strengthen those parts of your brain as you develop an understanding of how does the Rubik's Cube respond to me twisting it this way? And eventually you become an expert. I, I believe that developmentally, social interaction is the same kind of, kind of thing. You know, you learn through experience. You say something, someone responds, they didn't like it. You say that same thing to someone else, they respond, they also didn't like it. Okay, I probably shouldn't say that thing. You learn through interactions and your brain develops an understanding of how communication works and how people respond. Um, so I believe that in the context of isolation-induced autism or deficits in social interaction, that's what's happening is that you just haven't, you failed to exercise the, the proper brain circuits at a time where it really matters during that stage in development. In the case of autism though, like a genetic risk factor or genetic mutation that leads to autism, I actually believe that it's not that autism or it's not that the experience isn't there. It's that your brain, the systems that take the information from this interaction and encode it and remember it and integrate it into these brain systems that then subsequently regulate your interactions there's some molecular change that's affecting those systems that causes a problem with like reorganizing, restructuring those systems to allow you to like learn in social contexts. And that might sound like a little bit harsh or naive. Like I, I really hope it doesn't come off that way that, you know, like in my world, in my worldview, people with autism just like don't know how to interact. I think it's that basically what I'm trying to get at is that there's a molecular change in the way the brain handles social interaction 
that more interactions might not necessarily overcome it, but that it's just a chronic problem with, with how the brain functions. Um, that's biologically induced. And so in that case, that's, that's where I think, just like if you have depression and you know, you've tried everything you can, but you're, you're facing a biological change in the way your brain's functioning. That's just affecting your mood. Something like an SSRI might be the right choice in that case of autism maybe some pharmacological agent that can address that molecular change in the brain might be the right option. So that's just my take. Um, that take might change in years, or if I receive harsh criticism to the statements I've made on this podcast, um, <laughs> but I'm always open to learning. And, you know, this is just kind of my current understanding of, of brain biology and, and social interaction. Yeah. But now for your postdoc, you decided to go into a different field. Yeah. Um, and I'll admit part of that was induced by, so, okay, I, I mean, I, I'm studying empathy now. Um, when I finished my PhD, I made the decision that I would no longer study autism, at least for a short period of time. One, because there are so many genetic risk factors out there. And I had felt that the, the research I had done in my PhD really did make a difference on our understanding of the 16P 11.2 region but it's just one region and there's so many genes out there. And it just felt like, you know, if I just keep doing this, I'm going to be making such an incremental contribution to science and society that I'm not really sure if it's going to make me feel at the end of my career, like I've done enough. Um, and secondly, the experience I the experiences I had on social media where I realized if I'm going to be a scientist who's talking on social media about my research and talking about autism on social media, causes backlash, then maybe it just is a sign that I should be moving outside of autism. And and that's the reason I got into autism in the first place is because I'm interested in studying social behavior in general and the brain circuits that regulate social interaction. So it, it didn't, it, it wasn't unusual for me to exit the field of autism and just start studying exactly that, you know, what is empathy it, it, outside of the context of autism, what regulates that that in the brain. And so that's what I'm studying now. So you have a ton of really cool videos on this. So, and like my favorite is just this concept of like that um, if you're kind of like in a room or you look at a picture of someone in pain, the same kind of pathways get activated in your brain. So then you can like feel empathy yeah. and like you can feel their kind of pain. Oh, it That's is fascinating. I'm glad that you think it's cool too. Cause I, uh, I look at these studies and I am, my my mind is blown and I'm just like, I can't believe that this actually happens. And I'm just not sure. Is it like, is it because I'm interested in this field and I am conducting this research myself? And so I think it's cool. Or is this just something so cool in general? It, it's amazing because so much of the neuroscience research that's done is very, very like basic, like, okay, we're identifying that this brain area maybe is involved in this thing. And it's, this is just such a different type of research where what, we're sh what, what has been shown is that if you put a person in a situation where they're watching someone else in pain, they're watching someone else experience pain, either with a video or in person, th the same parts of the brain are activated in that bystander, the, the same parts of the brain that encode pain. And, uh, and I just think that's amazing because there's like, there's this weird kind of like supernatural component of it almost where it's like, your, your brains are synchronizing and that's not really what hap what's happening, I think, but, um, it just feels so supernatural. And I, I just think it's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like the placebo effect. I mean, when, when I like saw those videos, I really thought about the placebo effect, which is this crazy, like brain body connection. Yes. And do you mind if I just yeah. go on a rant, just summarizing some of this yes. research? Um, yeah, please do. Yeah. Okay. So I was just reviewing it before this because uh, I was hoping we might talk about it. Um, so yes, first things first, there are many studies showing that if you watch someone else experience pain, the same parts of your brain will activate as if you were experiencing the pain yourself. Why? Uh, <laughs> we don't really know. I mean, maybe because one theory um, and then, you know, there are many theories on this. I'm just going to say my perspective, not that I'm an expert at all, but this is just what I think you're to, to watch someone else experience pain. There may be some evolutionary benefit to like 
identifying with that pain and understanding that pain by recapitulating the brain activity yourself. Because it's like, same thing of like why you can't look away from a car accident or why you can't look away from an injury. It's because there's so much evolutionary information to be gained from watching someone else be harmed and learning about how you can avoid that yourself. Um, so by if you watch someone else in pain and you feel nothing, you learn nothing. If you watch someone else in pain and you feel that pain a little bit, you learn a little bit and you may be imp- increasing your chances of survival. Um, again, this is in the context of like ancient humans, not modern humans necessarily, um, that this brain biology evolved. Now, empathy itself is interesting too. So like when you watch someone else feel pain, you might feel some pain yourself. It may not be a physical pain, but it might be sort of like an empathic pain. Um, I'm sure we've all, we've all experienced cringe. You watch someone say something really embarrassing and it's just like, oh man, like you feel this, this pain in your chest and it's like, ah, I feel so bad for this person or someone's being exposed on tv like if you watch like reality tv you know someone's just getting berated or or their whole reputation is being destroyed and you just feel so bad for this person um which by the way there's lots of evidence that social pain and physical pain are processed very similarly in the brain um so if you're watching someone in physical pain you're watching someone in in social pain same parts of your brain are going to be activated roughly as them some there's a lot of overlap and um So now stepping into a sort of new but very related domain, placebo painkillers are extremely effective, um, at least in research settings. If you bring a person into an experiment and you put a cream on their hand and you say, this is a very potent analgesic medication, this is going to make you feel nothing on your hand, it's going to take away all the pain, and then you zap their hand with like a real actual painful stimulation they will report less pain, even though it's actually not an analgesic medication. It's literally just like cream. So placebo analgesia works in that setting. Now, some other studies have gone into looking at, does placebo analgesia also work for empathy for pain? So if you give someone, let's say acetaminophen, like Tylenol, and you expose them to another person being zapped or being, you know, hurt in some way, or you show them like images of like painful images, does it make them say that looks less painful? And it does. It actually makes people like, so now not placebo, but real painkillers actually reduce empathy for other people's pain. So there's another question there of do placebo painkillers reduce empathy for another person's pain? And that has been shown to be true also. So, (laughs) wow. (laughs) and now, and now here is the cherry on top, I think. A study was done where they gave people a fake painkiller, exposed them to another person experiencing pain, and then gave them a real drug called naltrexone, which is an opioid receptor antagonist. So it blocks endogenous opioid signaling. So opioid signaling is associated, you know, opioids are very potent painkillers, you know, something like morphine. You take morphine, you feel no pain. It's a very, very strong painkiller. The reason you feel no pain is because it's acting on these these endogenous, naturally occurring opioid receptors in the brain that can then cause pain relief. So what they did is they gave someone a fake painkiller and a real drug to block those opioid receptors, and they found that it blocked the fake painkiller's effects. And so so what what this would suggest is that when you intervene with real biology and block the brain's pain or pain relief signaling molecules that it generates naturally it blocks you from it blocks the the effects of placebo analgesia which which suggests that when you give someone a fake painkiller and you tell them it's real and they stop feeling pain for someone else or pain for themselves it's because the brain activates naturally occurring painkillers and actually causes true pain relief through those mechanisms which is just completely mind-boggling to me i think it yeah is like, this is this is absolutely insane i, I just i yeah. wonder how we can make use of this in like the pharmaceutical set or like in a medicinal setting like i mean i guess we're always using the placebo effect right because if you tell someone like i don't know someone has a certain disease and you tell them well this medication is going to help and you give them 
the drug, they probably also activate like a placebo effect because they think the drug's going to help. So I guess we always have the placebo effect in us, but I just wonder how we can make use of this to kind of like enhance the placebo effect to treat certain illnesses. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a phenomenal question, and it's probably the most important question of all, I think. Um, and I have little to say about it. I actually don't really know. Um, it's something I think about quite often. But what you've said is so interesting about placebos and and how they work and how they're always present. You know, it happens all the time. I'm sure doctors and nurses are used to seeing this. Um, I bet if anyone has thoughts on this, please reach out to me because I'd be curious. But, you know, we're like, you bring someone into the emergency room and you're like, I'm going to give you a painkiller and you just like hook up the IV, but you don't actually start the fluids yet. And they're like, Oh man, like, thank goodness, you know, or like there have been in, 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 um, antidepressant research, they always have to use the placebo control because if you just give people a sugar pill and tell them it's a SSRI or something, a new, you know, experimental drug, their depression scores will often actually reduce. They will actually experience some antidepressant effect of placebo. And so, it's funny because it doesn't really make sense to me that ex- an expectation of some change in the brain would cause that change in the brain because you would almost think that the brain would do the opposite. That like if the brain knows what's coming, it would do the inverse to compensate for that change. But it's actually doing it's going the same direction. You know, like you expect a painkiller, your body your brain activates a natural painkiller. You expect an antidepressant, your brain activates act- natural antidepressant. Why would that happen? I have no idea. Maybe I have a naive perspective on this. Once again, horribly ner- nervous about being wrong on the internet, but um, I, it just doesn't make sense to me. And, and maybe I'm overlooking something, but I, I think it's really interesting. And it could be very powerful, like you said. Yeah, it's interesting that you say, like, what if doctors just, you know, tell you getting a drug and then they just hook you to the IV and it's just sugar and water. And that's right. so funny because I really think that the only way that, or, I mean, it's just me thinking, but like one of the only ways that we can make use of the placebo effect or enhance um, enhance its effect is if doctors start becoming unethical and they just tell you like, you know, the effect of this drug, it's going to cure you completely. Mm-hmm. And so you think like the the drug is going to be a lot more effective than what it actually is. And that's and then you activate and enhance the placebo effect. The other thing that I thought is like, what if you could be like micro dosing psychedelic drugs, which kind of get you to, I don't know, maybe that could enhance the placebo effect. Um, I don't know. That was just like a crazy thought that I had. <laughs> micro dosing psychedelics <laughs> is always just worth throwing in there. Um, it, it is. I just feel like maybe for the placebo, effect, I just don't know it, how, what? what other way we could kind of enhance its effect yeah well i'll come back to the psychedelics thing in a second um the placebo thing i mean again going back to my experiences on social media you know i found that the internet you know the general public people who use tiktok and instagram people are very skeptical of medicine and science um some people are and when i talked about these when i created these videos talking about the studies that i was just describing that's the response that I got from a lot of people is perfect. This is just great. Now my doctor is going to be giving me fake medicine, you know, or, Oh, the doctors have been giving us fake medicine all along, just more evidence that we can't trust them. Uh, and it's kind of funny seeing how people respond, you know, unfortunately there's again, a lot of distrust. Um, but I think if this were to be used in any way, it only works. It it only appears to work. If you actually think you're getting a placebo, there are some studies that show that like, if they're told it's a placebo, it still helps. But I would assume that in most cases, you need to think you're getting a drug. The only way I could imagine this helping is like, you call your doctor's office and you're like, hey, or your psychiatrist, hey, I desperately need an appointment. You know, I'm, I'm really not okay. Um, and, the, and the psychiatrist is like, look, I'm really sorry, but I only have an appointment next week. But here's something, I'll send you a, a pill that you can take every day and it'll actually make you feel better from now until our appointment starts. And then we'll readdress, we'll, we'll reassess your, your uh, prescription. And it's a placebo pill and maybe it helps, you know, but in that sort of situation where it's a, it's a sort of a, um, uh, what's the word? I can't think. It's like a preventative kind of thing versus like you see your doctor and they're like, yes, I'm going to give you an SSRI. And then they give you a a sugar pill. That's super unethical. But I think if it could be used as sort of like a holdover kind of thing to help people in the meantime, maybe it would be useful. Um, But it's not going to work if people know that they're just giving you 
a sugar pill. Right. So that's exactly the thing. This would have to all, like this decision to do this would have to happen completely internal to medicine and have no public, like there would be no public awareness of it, you know? Huge conspiracy. Right. And then of course I'd make a TikTok about it and ruin everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so, but about the psychedelics thing, um, you know, we also study psychedelics uh, in our lab and a component of my project, a big component of my project involves MDMA, which is ecstasy. And uh, psilocybin, like microdosing psychedelic mushrooms, um, the, the, what we know right now, it's generally thought that the mechanism is by inducing plasticity in the brain. And so when you first said the microdosing thing, I was like, huh, I don't really know. Like I'm, I'm trying to link it together. And then it clicked where it's like, it actually could make sense because by inducing a little bit of plasticity, maybe you're allowing for more flexibility in those circuits for whatever is happening, you know, if it's depression, if it's pain, you're just creating just a little bit of flexibility to allow for some change, um, which is pretty interesting. I mean, heck, you could just give the placebo. It, it wouldn't even be a placebo. It'd be psil psilocybin. <laughs> but, no, the thing is, I would want to do a study where you, you're you testing for a drug. So you give the drug, you give the placebo, and then you give the placebo plus a micro dose of a psychedelic. And I would want to compare the effect of the placebo with the effect of the placebo plus the micro dose to kind of see how much more effective or how much, yeah, how in, how much enhanced is the placebo yeah, effect. Yeah, that'd be cool. You um, would also have to give the psychedelic yeah. alone though because it might be antidepressive. Yeah. yeah, that is also true. Well, I mean, yeah. This is not what I would do anyway, because it's not my field of research, but I always just find it interesting to think about. No, I, I really hope that down the road, if I end up running a research lab, um, all of my training is in mice, but I really hope that I can have a human component because studies like this, I mean, it would be just amazing to be able to recruit participants and, and run this type of study and uh, answer questions. Most of the questions that I think of are in humans. They're, they're, most of them are, are things that would be tested in humans. So um, maybe one day we'll see. Yeah. Um, do we understand the placebo effect though? Like on kind of like the mechanism of it? And I don't know, I, is it like a general mechanism or is it like we have no idea? I mean, I don't, uh, I can't really say confidently for things like antidepressant outside of the context of pain. I'm not really sure. So like an, like a placebo. Just talk about like pain, for example. Pain. I'm pretty sure all we know is what I mentioned where they gave naltrexone. Um, so that would, which would suggest that, that it's mediated by, uh, natural opioid signaling and endogenous opioid signaling. I'm pretty sure that that's all we know, but I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if there was more research, recent research on that. I think that paper was from 2015 and I'm sure that research group has still been active. So, uh, if I find more papers on it, I will 100% make TikToks about it. Cause I think it's so cool. Yeah. Um, and then another thought that I had about all your videos on like the fact that if you if you look at someone in pain, you can also experience pain and empathy for pain. Uh, does it work the same way for like something good? Like if you see some someone experiencing happiness, could you also activate the same kind of brain pathway so that you experience more happiness? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked this question. I hope, um, I'm not familiar with any research on that, but in humans, but in mice. So, in my research lab, Rob Malenka's lab at Stanford, there is a former postdoc named Monique Smith. She just recently started her lab in San Diego, and she developed this amazing thing in mice, which is called the social transfer of pain. And what it is, is you have one mouse that's experiencing pain and one mouse that's a naive bystander. They're not experiencing pain. And when you, in, you put them in together and they interact for about an hour, no, sorry, exactly one hour. This is research we're talking about. Very well controlled. Um then you separate them. The bystander mouse that's not actually in pain, if you test them for pain, for like sensitivity to a mechanical stimulus, if you poke their foot and they like they'll withdraw the, if it's like a pain, if they if it's perceived as painful or uncomfortable, they actually show a pain-like response for like a couple hours after. They actually like take on the pain phenotype. So it's a social transfer of pain. Um, and it's thought to be a measurement of empathy because they're, they're taking on the, the, the circumstance of the other mouse. Now, coming to the answer of your question, they also did the inverse experiment where both mice are in pain, but one mouse gets morphine. So 
and then you're testing the mouse that's in pain, interacting with the mouse that's in pain relief, and they also show that the pain relief transfers for a few hours, which completely that's, blows my mind. Wow. Com- yeah. I, that I do not understand. It's the most incredible thing in the world. And I will admit, um, the reason I'm so well-versed on this topic and I am so interested in talking about it is because my project is a, a follow-up paper to this. And, um, and I can say that I have myself found that effect. I have done that experiment myself and it is real. I've seen it in my own hands. That's incredible. That could have like huge potential. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's like if you have someone interact with someone who's feeling a lot better about the thing that you're not feeling good about, right? Whether it's pain or it's depression or it's PTSD or something, I don't know. Maybe it can be helpful, especially if maybe we can use some sort of agent to increase the empathy you feel for that person so that you take on more of their position. Maybe this could be used in a context of like two people with with depression. That's one, what I was thinking. Yeah, like one responds to SSRIs and has shown a great recovery. The other is treatment resistant. What if you could give the treatment resistant person something to, to help them take on the, uh, the neurophysiological state of the person who has uh, recovered from depression? Whether that's feasible or not, how long it would last... I have no idea, but that's that's what comes to mind in terms of what we translationally and clinically valuable here. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that'd be insanely fascinating. But you, yeah. So I, um, you study this in animals, and I always thought animals don't really feel that much empathy or don't have the ability to because they're not emotional. I mean, I guess dogs are, but like in general, like you've mentioned before, we kind of think of animals as like they go and hunt for food and they mate, and that's all they do, and. They don't really have emotions, but it seems like you can really study empathy on mice properly. So is this statement that we're all saying that, that animals are not emotional, like, is that false or? Yes. Um, it used to be thought that animals don't, you know, don't experience these higher level processes like empathy. But um, yeah, this paper I'm describing about the social transfer of pain, it's not the only one to show this in mice. There are other papers also showing empathy in mice. So, and again, it makes sense if, if like I, for the first thing I said about empathy, if it, in the context of like an evolutionary benefit to experience the pain of a, what we'd call a conspecific, another organism that's your same uh, species, it makes perfect sense for a mouse to also, uh, to experience this, especially a mouse, because, you know, you're out in a field and there's some poisonous snake and it's going around biting other mice and you're a mouse and you notice that all your buddies are in pain if you don't recognize that and start to experience a little bit of that yourself, you're probably going to end up in the same fate. But if you recognize the pain in your other animals and you start to feel it a little bit, or maybe, you know, you feel empathy for it, it, it can enhance the processing signal of maybe turning up your adrenaline levels and saying, okay, I got to get out of here. You know, this is a bad situation. So I think there's a lot of evolutionary benefit. And I think it would be um, surprising if it wasn't also in mice. Yeah. One quick thought, um, this study with empathy that you can feel, um, the other person's pain, uh, could that be used like with people that are less em- em- empathetic, empathic, mm-hmm. uh, for example, like sociopaths, which is people that feel less empathy. Yeah. Could you kind of use this? Um, I feel sort of the same way towards this that I do about autism where, um, I never really feel that a decision about treatment or a pharmacological agent should be made for anyone unless it's like a lethal situation. Um, and I have no idea how a person who is a sociopath and feels very little empathy would respond to the opportunity to feel more empathy. I genuinely have no idea. Um, it could be a potential application though. And I think, you know, especially in situations where this is a person who maybe the, it's like a pathological condition where they feel little empathy and it actually leads them to like maybe want to inflict violence on others or, or feel nothing about inflicting violence on others and they feel uncomfortable about that. They don't like that feeling, but they can't help it. Then maybe it could be helpful for them. But I, I truly know almost nothing about like the prevalence of that type of thing. Um, but it, it certainly could be beneficial. You alluded a bit to what you researched. Can you tell us more 
um i sort of can't about your project but i wish i could but fine. but i can promise you that when it is one day published there will be a tiktok video and, Perfect. and it, and it well, will be an exciting one that's good then uh you need to tell everyone what your TikTok is and what your Instagram is so that everyone can go follow you. Yeah. So on, okay. So my name is Ben Ryan. My last name spelled R E I N. And so my name on TikTok is Dr. Brain, B R E I N. I, cause on my scientific papers, it's abbreviated as B Ryan, which is one letter off from brain. And so I thought, why not? So it's Dr. D R period B R E I N that's on TikTok. Um, my, my Instagram handle is, the same thing, but the word doctor is spelled out just because DR period wasn't available. It, it basically to simplify all this, if you have any interest in following me on any social media, connecting with me via email or anything, or, you know, any, anything related to me, you can just go to my website, which is Ben Ryan, B E N R E I N, uh, com, And that everything, all the links will be on there. Yeah. We'll also link everything to the episode description. So people can also just click on those links, but perfect. yeah, I'd highly recommend following you on Instagram since it's just like <laughs> one minute videos and there I've learned a lot from them. So oh, thank you. yeah. And by the but, way, uh, one last thing, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just, I realized that it might be far too late at this point, but I realized when we were talking about autism, um, I never got around to explaining that autism is not caused by vaccines. Um, that is not one of the environmental causes uh, you know, I, I discussed how exposure to toxins and pollutants and stuff can induce vaccine or can induce autism, but vaccines is not one of them. And uh, that was that originally stemmed from a 1998 paper by Andrew Wakefield, which was um, falsified evidence. The, Andrew Wakefield was a scientist. He was involved in a lawsuit against a, a vaccine producing company and he needed evidence. So he falsified data showing that it, the MMR vaccine causes autism. And it turned out to later be discovered, like, it was like way too late. It was like 12 years later or something like that, that it was fake. Yeah, I think it got retracted in like 2010. Insane. Yeah, yeah. It's way, way too late. Right. So we've had 12 years of people believing that autism is caused by vaccines. And now we're doing our best, again, 12 years later to address that uh, misunderstanding. So there have been many very carefully done studies showing that autism is not associated with MMR vaccine or other vaccines. So um, if you're concerned about vaccinating your child and you're worried about autism as a potential outcome, I assure you to, to not be concerned about that because there is no scientific link. It's good. Yeah, I, I was like looking at the time and I was like, oh, if I like start mentioning Andrew Wakefield and all of that, we're just going <laughs> to overrun. But I was like, oh, I really want to talk about this. But it's really good that you mentioned it because I just I think it's done so much damage. And especially now with the COVID vaccine as well. I just think that there's still so many anti-vax that stem from Andrew Wakefield and his following. Um, and it scares me to think that if he was able to do it, like it could be that there's other cases as well. So we really need to pay attention that we're reading the correct sources and we really think about the papers that get published. The peer review journal needs to also, uh, the peer review process needs to really be strict about this. And yeah, but that's uh, maybe a conversation for another time. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I try to get to the main plans. points. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, yeah, but thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. That's part two. Thank you all so much for listening. If you would like to learn more about Ben, I recommend you check out his website, which is benryan.com. If you like our podcasts, make sure to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and on Instagram. Thank you all for listening. Bye. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Serena Thrankumar, and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye!